okay, wonderful. I'm not sure exactly where I left off. I apologize, but um, uh, let me introduce myself again, Aransa Sulaskarain. I am the Assistant University Director here at the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. And thank you for joining us for the last webinar of a series where we've been focusing on the fourth National Climate Assessment, commonly referred to as the NCA4. We focused um, specifically on the key messages of the Southeast chapter, but last month we also did um, an overview of the Caribbean chapter, which is a new chapter um, in the NCA. And today we're exploring the Tribes and Indigenous Peoples chapter with Rachel Novak and Casey Thornbrew. And um, it's particularly vital that we cover this chapter because on this occasion of the NCA4, we wanted to be sure that there were case studies um, involving um, tribes and indigenous communities efforts and challenges with climate adaptation. Um, so it is with our intention with these webinars for you all to hear directly from each of the lead authors. In this case, Rachel Novak was the lead federal coordinating author of chapter 15. Uh, we also have Casey Thornbrew with us uh, and I'll introduce Casey to you. Casey works very closely with us here in the Southeast and in the Northeast. But we want to also leave room after the presentations to have an opportunity to do a Q&A with them. Um, and also to make sure that the audience knows how to use all the components and data within, within each of the, of the key messages and or chapters. Um, so we have a quick poll for you um, that will really help us understand who's on the call today and how best to continue um, formatting or packaging up information related to the NCA4. Um, you may have also received the study guide that we prepped in advance of this webinar that has lots of resources pertaining to this topic. And if you miss that study guide, please let me know. Um, I'll give you my contact information and we're happy to post that information because we did um, plan that study guide in advance thinking of all the resources that might be helpful. Okay, so wonderful. And while we pull up Rachel's slides here, I wanted to uh, be sure to give you a little um, introduction to Rachel Novak. Rachel is Navajo Diné, and she's the coordinator of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Resilience Program, and she also serves as the Tribal Resilience Science Coordinator. Um, she was also the federal coordinating lead author for this chapter, uh, chapter 15. At the BIA, she leads efforts to support tribal resilience, including the annual competitive funding opportunity for tribal adaptation planning. And for quite some time, 2008 to 2015, she worked on the development of water quality standards through the Clean Water Act of the Office of Water at the US EPA. She has a master's degree in geosciences from the University of Arizona and a BS and a BA in environmental science from Oregon State University. I'd also like to introduce at this time, Casey Thornbrew. Casey serves as a liaison between tribes in the Northeast and the Southeast, the United South and Eastern Tribes, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and climate science researchers to provide current climate and science information to identify climate research needs and priorities and to provide climate adaptation planning support. Casey is a citizen of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe with an educational background in climate science. His PhD research focused on investigating climate teleconnections and North American precipitation variability and working with tribal communities to develop culturally responsive climate science curricula for teaching students in tribal colleges and K through 12 schools. So thank you so much, Casey and Rachel. I appreciate it so much that you took the time um, in this, these challenging times we're in right now to provide an overview um, of this material. And so let me see if we've got Rachel <coughs> queued up. Thank you so much, Rachel. So whenever you're ready. Yes, I apologize for the technical issues. Um, thank you so much for your patience, everyone. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start then. Mm -hmm. on the first slide. Um, so, uh, good morning. Um, I'm here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where it's still morning. Um, I am the BIA Tribal Resilience Program uh, Coordinator, and I served as the federal coordinating lead author for Chapter 15 of the Fourth National Climate Assessment. And I worked with a really great author team. Uh, for about three years uh, to develop this chapter. 
Uh, and MC4 is really progressing in terms of addressing impacts on and actions of indigenous peoples. And chapter 15 isn't the only place the, the assessment addresses um, indigenous peoples issues. Um, so we coordinated with author teams across the entire assessment to really ensure that there was integration and representation of indigenous peoples' issues and actions in every chapter. Uh, we present posters at AZU, the American Geophysical Union, in December 2018, shortly after it came out. And I was so inspired because I saw so many um, indigenous peoples' um, key issues represented as the key messages across almost every regional chapter across the assessment. So it was really inspiring to see that culminate there. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So I'll start off a little bit just with um, uh, acknowledging a little bit about the state of the sector. Um, we focused on um, trying to set the context by acknowledging that there are diverse and distinct political and cultural groups and populations that comprise what we consider tribes and indigenous populations. Um, and that they can be affected by climate change in ways that are, of course, similar to other uh, communities and populations, but they can also be affected very uniquely and disproportionately. And that the histories and the shared experiences um, across many indigenous and tribal communities engenders distinct knowledge about climate change impacts and adaptation strategies. Um, and following from that, that traditional knowledge systems can play a role in advancing the understanding of climate change uh, to develop more comprehensive climate adaptation strategies. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so we have these three um, key messages in our chapter. We had um, a national chapter um, that was really focused on um, the nation rather than the regions. And so uh, we had three key, three key messages. Um, and we pulled this from key literature on climate risks and impacts and also um, the actions that are out there. Uh, we developed a database of tribal adaptation actions that is part of the chapter um, and also lives on the BIA Tribal Resilience website. So you can take a look there and, and we'll do a little run through um, towards the end of the presentation just to show some examples of that. Um, and our, I'll go into our key messages. <laughs> so um, next slide, please. So our first key message is really focused on indigenous livelihoods and economies at risk. The, um, the third NCA prior to the fourth, um, it really set a strong baseline um, in terms of the climate change impacts on traditional livelihoods and economies. And we wanted to build from that and also address some of the impacts on commercial um, and tribal, uh, commercial, um, tribal economies as well. So including things like impacts on recreation, energy, and tourism because these economies are affected by climate change, um, but compounding and complicating this, there's often the institutional barriers to self-determined management of water, land, and other natural resources and infrastructure. So that's, that's kind of our, our focus um, and key message one. So next slide. Um, so the second key message, oh, and um, so this was um, one of the, uh, the, the figures, the key figures from that theme as well. Um, that was focused on how um, infrastructure and economic vulnerabilities are really um, interconnected um, in kind of a nested sort of way. Um, so we've got the household and the community infrastructure, and then kind of building um, up from that, the regional systems um, infrastructure, um, that, and those are obviously very linked. And then uh, linked to both of those is essential services. Um, so things like disaster response, policing, health services, those rely on infrastructure at those other levels um, to be able to operate. And climate can disrupt um, the communities um, at all these different levels. Um, so they, they act is, um, and interdependent, or interdependently um, and can really affect um, one another when any of them are disrupted. And we're probably seeing that right now um, in a lot of communities. Um, especially when it comes to essential services um, in this, this time of um, this, this COVID-19 um, concerns that are they're spreading across the world and affecting our indigenous communities as well. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So um, the second key message that we focused on was really about risk to physical, mental, and indigenous values-based health. Um, indigenous values-based health is, is focused on the interconnectedness of social and ecological systems. So if climate change disrupts these systems, individual and community health will be uniquely challenged through impacts to land, water, food, plants, and animals. 
And these impacts can then threaten sites, practices, and relationships with cultural, spiritual, or ceremonial importance that are central to indigenous people's heritage, identity, and physical and mental health. Okay, and we'll go to the third key message on the next slide. And this is really focused on adaptation, disaster management, displacement, and community-led relocation. So as I mentioned earlier, so there is a lot of discussion and acknowledgement of the risks. We also didn't want to stop there when there's so much going on um, activity-wise, action-wise, in indigenous um, communities. So many indigenous peoples have been proactively identifying and addressing impacts and developing plans um, that are important aspects across um, the entire um, national climate assessment. But there are institutional barriers that can really limit adaptive capacity, um, and including limited access to traditional territory and resources and limitations of existing policies, programs, and funding mechanisms. Um, this key message also importantly discusses how a successful adaptation in indigenous context relies on the use of indigenous knowledge and re resilience and robust social systems and protocols and a commitment to the principles of self-determination and proactive efforts of government at all levels to help alleviate those institutional barriers. Okay, and then the next slide, we have our figure 15.3. So as displacement and community-led relocation is a focus of key message three, that the figure illustrates the common issues that um, are, are facing uh, coastal communities, especially in the southeast. Um, and here on the, on the left side, um, we have an aerial uh, view of Ildijan Charles in Louisiana, that indigenous community that, um, yeah, they're facing um, flooding and sea level rise and, um, and uh, the discussions community of community-led um, relocation, community-led uh, relocation to um, higher ground. And I think Casey might be talking a little bit more about that after, after my presentation. And then on the right, you have um, another indigenous community up in Kibbeen, Alaska, who's also facing um, severe issues um, that are leading them to um, also think about and plan for community-led relocation um, as well, and how to also protect in place um, um, until that can occur. So uh, two, lo two indigenous communities in very different locations, but who are impacted um, very similarly. Um, and uh, so this was figure 15.3. Um, the next slide um, is similar to that. Um, and this just features um, members of the Ildijan Charles community and emphasizes that active planning is going on in many indigenous communities facing displacement and how important it is for the communities to be um, involved in leading that um, as a representation of their, their self-determination as indigenous peoples. Okay, and we'll go to the next slide. And part of what we developed um, for the national, for the fourth national climate assessment um, was a glossary of terms. We thought it was really important to maintain consistency across NCA4 since there was so much content focused on tribal and indigenous communities. So we wanted to make sure that we were using these terms across the, the assessment um, with as much consistency as possible. And so um, we developed this, um, this glossary, this is indigenous people's terminology, um, and it's you can find it um, at the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals website. Um, at the link there, um, and on the right, you can see the, the terms that we really focused on for, um, for the uh, the assessment and trying to maintain consistency. And we want to make sure folks know it's not definitive or exhaustive by any means, but the terms were generally more widely used, and it seemed like it would be worthwhile to provide that general definition of how they're used in the assessment. So they're pretty concise, um, and it's a quick read if you would like to go take a look. So just hop over to the ITEP website um, at that link um, if you'd like to, to learn more. Okay, on the next slide. Um, so I wanted to circle back to adaptation actions. So as an author team, we thought it was really important to build on the previous assessment um, from NCA3 uh, back in 2014, and the assessments that, that preceded that as well. So we continue to emphasize the impacts um, on and the barriers facing indigenous peoples, but there are so many adaptation actions 
Um, there's many, many activities tribes have been um, undertaking in the last decade even just to address climate change through planning, vulnerability assessments, monitoring, capacity building, and more. So in 2016, we started to develop a database of actions. Uh, we inquired um, about activities from our federal partners that had been funded, focused on tribal climate adaptation and vulnerability. And we identified, um, at that time, over 800 actions and developed a living interactive web uh, map application. Um, and since it is a living document, we've continued to add to this. Um, and so right now we have over 1,100 um, throughout the, the nation that are on this interactive mapping app. Um, and it, it is living, so if you don't see something that's currently um, in the interactive map, which is on our um, BIA Tribal Resilience website, um, please let us know, send an email, um, and we can make sure to add it. Um, so you can, you can send that uh, directly to me. Um, so we'll be adding more to this map um, after this year even because we're, we plan on um, having a, a robust awards program again. Um, we're currently in the review process, and so uh, once we get those in um, later this spring, we'll, we'll be adding those, and then we'll also be working on um, working with uh, our federal partners that we initially started working on <laughs> uh, back in 2016 to update what's been happening um, since then. So we, we imagine that towards the end of summer, we're going to um, build uh, a, uh, an even larger database of indigenous peoples' um, climate resilience actions to this. So I'm going to take you on a quick kind of run through of, of what this interactive map looks like. So um, as you can see here, um, there's icons um, that correspond to different action types. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so the action types um, are right there. We have focus. We tried to bend things um, in general areas. So the, uh, there's planning and assessment, adaptation and implementation, monitoring and research, governance capacity building, and then use and con cultural continuity. Um, and you can search um, up in the upper left. You could search in by a tribe or, um, or a tribal organization name up there as well uh, to filter down a little bit. And um, we have it um, organized by NCA for region. So that's what the different colors in the map um, in terms of the region, what they represent. Okay, so next slide. Um, so you can zoom in to the region of interest. Um, and so for this one, um, this is focused more on the Southeast. Um, we're gonna zoom into the Southeast. So let's go to the next slide. I zoomed in. <laughs> Um, again, you can see the different action types, um, and I'll show you how you can learn a little bit more about the sectors as well. So next slide. Um, you can also, um, yeah, so you can filter if you just want to know maybe what's been going on planning and assessment, you can um, just click on that. Um, or if you want to just, you really focus more on governance or capacity building, you can just click on that and um, it will filter by just those action types. Another thing you can do with this map. And the next slide. Um, so for this example, um, I pulled up the, um, the Eastern Bound Cherokee um, Indians. And if you go to the next slide, I kind of try to zoom it in a little bit more so you can see better. Um, but this example um, just shows the pop-up window that comes up when you click on um, a tribe or a tribal organization. And in this pop-up window, um, you can see obviously the name of the of the tribe or organization, um, and then below that the activity type. So in this case, it's a planning and assessment focus. Um, and then there's a sector tag as well. And this one um, we have focused on mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then there's a link for more information right there. And so we'll go to the next slide. Um, so if you click on the um, ellipse um, just on the lower le lower right of the pop-up window, it will bring this drop-down window up. Um, and you can click View and Attribute Table, or you could also pull it up from the very bottom, um, uh, that little dark arrow at the bottom of the screen. And that will pull up this Attribute Table if you go to the next slide. Um, that will give you a bit more information. Um, and this is really useful too if you're looking at, at a regional scale um, to see all the different uh, activities that have um, been undertaken in a region. Um, or if a tribe has multiple activities, um, it'll pull it up there. So 
that could be useful. Um, but this is, again, this is a living, um, a living mapping application. So we're going to continue to add more to this after our current awards process um, and after uh, we get more information from our federal colleagues um, uh, and others, um, but non-federal to the extent we're able to um, later this summer. So please uh, check back and, and see any updates we have then. And if you have any feedback, we, we welcome that as well. Um, so um, in the last slide, I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge the author team that we worked with on this chapter and the coordinators um, that worked so hard um, for three years <laughs> to pull this together. And uh, I want to thank you everyone um, on, the, on the webinar today for joining. Um, and so I'll end the chapter overview here and um, I guess I'll turn it over to Casey. Uh, we need to start and talk to Lisa Casey Thornbrew, on the Thomas Mississippi. Uh, good day and hello. My name is Casey Thornbrew, and I'm a citizen of the Mashi Wampanoag tribe. Um, I am the tribal climate science liaison with the United South and Eastern tribes, uh, and I work with uh, both the, the DOI Northeast and Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Centers. Um, the United South and Eastern tribes, also known as USET, is a nonprofit intertribal organization. Uh, and we currently represent 30 federally recognized tribal nations um, in the south and eastern uh, parts of, of the U.S. USAID works to support tribal nation governments and to provide technical support and services to tribal programs. Our motto is strength and unity. For this presentation, I'm going to segue into aspects of the fourth national climate assessment that focus on tribal nations in the southeast. Some of the examples I share will come out of chapter 19, the southeast regional chapter, and other examples I will share uh, include learned examples of tribal climate change resilience activities uh, since the fourth assessment, which can hopefully be included into future assessments. I would like to start with an overview of tribal nations and indigenous communities in the Southeast. Tribal nations and indigenous communities uh, in the Southeast have millennia long relationships uh, and traditional knowledge of profoundly diverse landscapes and climate zones found throughout the region. I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, the Southeast does have a legacy of forced removal of, of tribal nations during the 1800s. Why this matters today is because uh, there are cultural landscapes of specific tribal cultures um, that now extend from the Atlantic and Gulf Coast all the way to the Southern Plains and Prairies or what is now Oklahoma. Uh, just geographically speaking, you have, for example, uh, the Cherokee, Choctaw, uh, and Seminole nations, which are tribal nations located geographically in Oklahoma, but you also have Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, and Seminole Tribe of Florida, uh, which are tribal nations located geographically in North Carolina, Mississippi, and Florida respect, respectively. Um, this is important to address uh, because the literature may say uh, use terms such as uh, relocation and removal, but what has happened is actually an expansion of uh, tribal nation cultural landscapes. So the point here is a reminder to look at the entire Southeast as a dynamic cultural landscape of tribal nations. Currently for fairly recognized tribal nations, numerous state recognized and all indigenous communities in the Southeast, the challenges of adapting to a changing climate are coupled with efforts for protection of land, sovereignty, languages, uh, cultures, infrastructure, and communities. Climate adaptation pro uh, projects have been framed by indigenous knowledge to address impacts to culturally and economically important uh, resources and species, such as river cane, wild grants, as well as changes to ecosystems of uh, cultural relationships. Although not all tribally led uh, climate research and or adaptation efforts are recorded or published uh, for the Southeast region, there are numerous uh, climate change adaptation uh, efforts. The first uh, key message from the Southeast chapter is that cities are particularly vulnerable um, to climate change compared to other cities uh, in the US. With with expected impacts to infrastructure and human health. Although core communities of tribal nations are often in rural locations of the Southeast, some tribal nations have either an urban center or have communities that are adjacent or located within urban areas. 
meaning that climate change impacts related to health and infrastructure from heat, flooding, um, or vector-borne disease um, are not exclusive just to large urban areas, but can also impact tribal communities. Uh, just as an example, a few weeks ago, uh, you said we had our Tribal Utility Summit hosted by the Kishara uh, Tribe of Louisiana. One of the things I learned from tribal wastewater operators is that wastewater systems for communities or for tribal businesses must factor in events like heavy rainfall or weather-related events that could impact the system, as would an urban area, but just on a smaller scale. Although the 1930s uh, still hold the record for the highest number of hot days above 95 degrees, for example, in the southeast, uh, there have been, uh, there's been a significant increase in the number of warm nights above 75 degrees in the past four decades. This coupled with daytime high, high temperatures has led to a gradual trend toward warming in the southeast from the 1970s onward. Average summer temperatures during the most recent 10 years have been the warmest on record, with very large increases in nighttime temperatures and more modest increase in daytime temperatures. Hot days and warm nights together impact human comfort and health and result in higher energy needs for increased cooling efforts. Agriculture can also be impacted by lack of nighttime cooling. The number of days per year with heavy precipitation events has also increased. The figure on top shows the change in the annual number of days with rainfall greater than three inches in the southeast from 1900 to uh, 2016. And the top center figure shows a trend at individual stations from 1950 to 2016. The number of days with heavy rainfall has increased at most stations, particularly since the 1980s. As an example of what that looks like, um, the photo on the top right shows um, an event that occurred in South Carolina in October 2015, where rainfall records uh, broke um, daily all-time records. Hurricanes and tropical storms um, in the southeast have also contributed to breaking daily rainfall records. It is expected that extreme precipitation events will likely increase in frequency in the southeast. The second key message is related to flooding, but more in coastal and low-lying regions due to the combined effects of extreme rainfall and sea level rise. The southeast is unique to the rest of the U.S and that its coastal topography is very flat, and a one-foot vertical sea level rise in some places can move seawater inland for miles. On average, global sea level rise has been about, has risen about eight to nine inches since the late 1800s, with three inches of this occurring since 1990. However, the combination of local effects, such as damage to wetlands and land subsidence or sinking, has caused some low-lying areas in the southeast to experience as much as one to three feet of local sea level rise in the past 100 years. There are many tribal nations and communities in coastal areas in the southeast. These tribal nations are either currently impacted by sea level rise and having to relocate their entire community, as is the case uh, with the Isle de Jean Charles tribal community, or tribal nations must consider impacts of future sea level rise in community and infrastructure planning. Here are just a couple of figures to illustrate uh, sea level rise and planning using Norfolk, Virginia, and Charleston, uh, South Carolina as examples. The curve in the left figure shows a range of daily and maximum uh, high water levels, or the highest tides, and the probability of flooding in Norfolk, Virginia for the 1960s and, and 2010s. Local sea level rise pushes this probability curve uh, to the right, which is what is observed today. For example, Norfolk has six more days a year of high tide flooding than it did 50 years ago. The figure on the right shows the city of Charleston sea level rise 50-year planning um, outlook based on existing sea level rise projections uh, from 2015 going outward. You can see the range even going out to 2100 is pretty wide uh, from another foot of sea level rise to seven-foot sea level rise being within the realm of possibility. 
The city of Charleston is planning for 2065 is using a 1.5 sea level uh, rise increase scenario for short term things uh, such as uh, parking lots or and planning for a 2.5 uh, sea level rise increase for critical longer term uh, investments such as energy routes or excuse me emergency routes and public buildings. So again, these are just a couple examples of planning. A third key message is that natural ecosystems in the southeast will change. Changing winter temperature extremes, wildfire patterns, sea level rise, uh, hurricanes, floods, and droughts, and warming ocean temperatures are expected to redistribute species and greatly modify ecosystems. As a result, the ecological and cultural resources that these depend on uh, for livelihood, protection, um, and well-being are at risk. Future generations can expect uh, to ex uh, expect and experience um, to interact with natural systems that look very different than those we see today. For tribal nations, communities, and cultures, uh, a term, for example, such as uh, ecosystem services may not quite fully encompass tribal nation relationships to ecosystems. Although citizens and communities of tribal nations do benefit from healthy ecosystems, other concepts such as reciprocity and community identity play a major role. Uh, for example, many tribal nation names um, derived from languages are tied to the identity, uh, are tied to place because they translate to people of a place or, or its characteristic. For example, people of the wild rice, people of the freshwater, et cetera. Thus, changing ecosystems factor into cultural identity. Lastly, the ranges of many culturally significant plant and animal species are moving northward on land and in ocean beyond the homelands of tribal nations. While tribal lands lead to US policies such as reservations, relocation, um, et cetera, remain politically fixed meaning the people and community connected to the ecosystem cannot as easily move with a moving ecosystem due to climate change. Furthermore, invasive plant and animal species that are favored by warmer conditions have moved into ecosystems, thus competing with native species, which tribal nations have relied upon for millennia. One way to look at potential changes uh, in ecosystems is to look at projected uh, changes in plant hardiness zones. Increasing winter temperatures are expected uh, to result in a northward shift of the zone conducive to growing various types of plants. Based on these uh, projected changes, free sensitive plants uh, or crops like uh, oranges, papayas, mangoes would be able to survive in new areas. However, warmer winters would also favor invasive species with ranges previously limited by temperature. So for example, the map on the top right shows the expansion of the zone suitable to um, oranges um, but we also have a photo uh, of a Brazilian red pepper tree, a Brazilian pepper tree, which is um, uh, causing an issue to ecosystems uh, in Florida. The fourth and final key message from chapter 19 is that climate change poses economic and risk for rural communities. Um, I think in some cases this relates closely to key message number one in the tribes and indigenous peoples chapter. Um, to summarize, more frequent extreme heat and changing climates are projected to increase public health impacts and economic vulnerabilities in the agriculture, timber, and manufacturing sectors. These would also be compounded with existing social stresses in rural areas uh, related to limited access to services. Um, to elaborate on this, in terms of uh, how tribal nations and communities are concerned, many community cores of tribal nations are in rural areas of the Southeast. However, there's a tremendous diversity in economic development, services, and situations. In some cases, tribal nations are the largest employer of regional counties that they are located in. That being said, economic impacts to rural tribal nations also means economic impacts to rural non-tribal communities that are employed um, by, um, by tribal nations. I would like to now mention some tribal-based uh, climate change resilient actions. Some of these actions are mentioned in the Southeast chapter, um, and other examples are those I've learned along the way, uh, for example, to site visits um, with uh, tribal nations um, as a tribal climate science liaison. The Eastern Band of Cherokee 
uh, Indians through its Natural Resources Division um, with partners uh, such as with the U.S. Forest Service have been doing research and education on sustainable harvesting of mountain ramps, which some may know may also known as the wild onion, um, and is a traditional food source for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Shown in these photos is a, is a ramp and also a sustainable harvesting method, a method which leaves much of the bulb intact so it can keep producing. The Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians has also done seed banking of culturally important plants as well as working with elders and knowledge keepers and scientists to document the Cherokee language names, Latin, science na Latin scientific names, and common names of species. Other activities include forest uh, management, including prescribed burning and monitoring of water temperature and flow and air quality. Water temperature and flow monitoring is especially important because due to its elevation, this area supports the most southern cold water fishery in the east. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians is developing a river cane restoration program to bring back cult a culturally and economically important plant species. River cane, also known as swamp cane, is a native plant and a key feature of the southeastern landscape. It is also commonly referred to as North America's native bamboo. River cane is actually culturally important and used by many tribal nations in the southeast. However, its current habitat is down to less than 2% of its former range as it was during pre-colonial times. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians River Cane Habitat Restoration efforts include working with tribal youth. Um, they have observed a youth take, to take ownership and extra diligence in protecting the restored sites. Another effort is bringing back fire to tribal lands in the Southeast. Many Southern and Eastern tribal nations have used, always used fire for a variety of purposes, including habitat restoration and the regrowth of traditional foods and medicines. Um, early colonizers and European settlers noted in their documents the practice of burning um, and fire as part of the landscape. Uh, forced removal of tribal nations, fire suppression, and the reduction of fire in the Southeast landscape as in other parts of the country has, in, has enabled some areas uh, to rebuild their fuel loads uh, for larger, more catastrophic fire, wildfires. Fire is coming back to the southeast landscape, as shown here, um, as an experiment in the increased use of prescribed fire at Fort Benning, Georgia, which led to a decrease in wildfire occurrence from 1982 to 2012. Tribal nations such as the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the aforementioned um, Eastern Band of Cherokee have been working to do prescribed burns um, on their lands. The Seminole Tribe of Florida has been conducting a culturally based assessment and decision making uh, process for climate change and plants and animals and places of cultural significance. The intention is to have a seminal community focus on people, places, uh, plants, and animals. And in other words, a process and decision making that preserves community identity. The Seminole Tribe of Florida Heritage and Environmental Resource Office, also known as HERO, has been leading this effort and working towards a tribal climate change adaptation plan with a framework uh, that can be shared with other tribal nations also working towards climate change adaptation planning. Partnerships have been developed in this effort with the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center and North Carolina uh, State University. The photos here of the site are of a site visit myself, uh, Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and North Carolina State University staff, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida HERO staff in 2019. Following site visits to Big Cypress Reservation, Brighton Reservation, and the Hollywood, Hollywood Reservation, we reconvened to map the places visited and to discuss initial thoughts on these places. At the same time, HERO staff have been working diligently to get in, input from communities to keep this assessment grounded in Seminole identity. I would like to conclude by discussing some of the climate resilience activities um, USAID has been doing um, in addition to site visits. Since 2018, we have been doing climate change vulnerability assessment or adaptation plan writing retreats for tribal staff who have been tasked with completing plans for their tribal nation. These retreats allow for focus time for staff to make headway on their drafts. 
Last year, we also held a Climate Change Resilience Summit for the USET region hosted by the Oneida Indian Nation. This summit brought together tribal leaders, staff, Northeast and Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center staff, tribal youth, and college students to address climate change in the South and Eastern region. USET is also planning a tribal climate camp akin to the tribal climate camps held in the Pacific Northwest. Um, these camps bring together teams of tribal leaders, staff, and community members um, to learn uh, about initiating, initiating climate adaptation planning um, or to integrate climate adaptation planning into existing programs. Of course, due to the COVID-19 uh, situation, we are having to push this camp back, but we are still intent on having it. On these efforts, USIT has been partnering with other tribal organizations, such as the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, College of the Menominee Nation, Institute for Environmental Professionals, uh, for these types of workshops, summits, and climate camps. Lastly, we have a new uh, webpage on climate change adaptation stories and resources, which we've been updating uh, monthly, but also on a needs basis as we get more information on events and upcoming funding opportunities. I would like to acknowledge the author team of the Southeast chapter, which includes those uh, staff from the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, um, Aranzu Lasprevain and Adam Tarando, and also other regional university federal land trust partners. I would also like to acknowledge the technical contributors of the USGCRP uh, coordinators for uh, the Southeast chapter, and would like to acknowledge the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians Natural Resources Division, Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians Environmental Department, and Seminole Tribe of uh, Florida Heritage and Environmental Resources Office. Katap uh, Tanmu, and uh, thank you for this, uh, your time today on this webinar. Casey and Rachel, thank you so much for wonderful presentations. Um, I'm just so heartened by uh, these specific examples of climate adaptation resiliency um, taking place all over the Southeast. Um, so I'd like to really honor um, those efforts tremendously. Um, well, we have some time for questions. And if anyone would like to go ahead and type a question into the chat box, please do so. Okay, how can we get in touch with Casey and Rachel? Um, hello, everyone. So uh, you can, first and foremost, uh, my information can be found on the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center uh, website um, on the staff page there. Um, you can also reach me uh, through uh, USET's um, uh, page, which also has staff listed. So um, can make sure and uh, uh, have my contact that way. And I think uh, our presentations may be saved too, so my information is on there as well. Yeah, thank you, Casey. Um, that is true. We are recording this. Some people have asked us um, about the recordings. I've just entered Casey's email address there, um, and also Rachel has added her uh, staff her information regarding uh, the Tribal Resilience Program, uh, which is, um, I'd also like to really applaud Rachel and her team, Alyssa Samoy and others, um, for already running for the past several years, a terrifically important, vibrant um, Tribal Resilience Program. So thank you again, Rachel. Um, yeah, Rachel, you're unmuted if you'd like to um, chime in. We have a question here from Nikki Cooley. Um, Casey mentioned reciprocity. How difficult and realistic is this? Just wondering about this. Thank you. Yes, so I think in terms of so realistic and, and, and difficult. Um, so to elaborate a little bit on, on reciprocity, um, you know, it's an exchange. It's uh, you know, for those listening, um, you know, in, in the environment and ecosystems, you know, that which we take as people, we, you know, try to find a way to restore or give back. Uh, many um, you know, traditional practices are, you know, um, if, if you take something, you, you leave something there um, behind. And I think the point of that is that it keeps you in a good relationship with that environment. It, it helps to prevent overuse and um, things like that. Um, it is a challenge. So in terms of um, it, it's something that has to be taught, but also practiced. 
Um, so uh, many tribal uh, nations and indigenous culture, cultures, um, if you're if you're fortunate to, to learn that, you, you put that into practice into your life, but then you have that responsibility to, you know, teach it to your kids and grandkids or next generation or even friends and community members uh, to keep that practice of reciprocity going. So uh, thank you for that question. We have another question from Deborah. Is training available to local people of place who are non-tribal? I think um, I was just pausing there just, just also see if uh, Rachel wanted to ch chime in. But what I would say real quickly is, so right now our current focus is to assist and provide uh, support to, to tribal nations. Um, what I try to encourage is whenever possible that partners um, do participate in some of these to the extent able. And, and some of those are like larger summits and conferences and meetings are open to um, uh, non-tribal partners to, to come and participate as well. So I kind of look at that as like a starting point. Um, I don't know, Rachel, did you want to weigh in on that a little bit? Sure, sure. And I am taking this as though it's uh, referring to tribal climate adaptation planning training, since that's what we, that's what at least our program does mostly with um, Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, um, including Nikki Cooley, who's, who's on the webinar as well. Um, but I, I will say that, um, you know, a lot of times, like staff on tribal, um, of tribal programs, they're allies, they're, they're not necessarily from that tribe, or they might not be native, um, but they're, they're allies, and they work for the tribes. And so, um, so I believe, you know, uh, those, those folks often uh, go to the trainings representing the tribe through their programs. Um, and so, in that aspect, um, you know, if you know, there's allies that are working with tribes. Um, I think usually, you know, um, uh, trainings are, are open if they're if they're working kind of on behalf of tribes in that instance. Um, and I mean, I'm, most most trainings and things that I'm aware of um, aren't necessarily um, they're not they're not only for tribal people. Like if you're going and you're you're interested and you're working with a tribe. Um, you know, usually you probably would, would be able to attend as well, um, especially if um, what you're trying to learn would, would benefit um, tribes you're working with. I hope that helps a little bit. I'm not, maybe I'm, I'm misreading the question, but that's how I'm taking it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a, is an important question from Carol who is um, mentioning that a lot of the examples were from federally recognized tribes on this presentation, but in the Southeast, we have such a large number of um, state recognized or even unrecognized um, tribal and indigenous communities in the southeast and what kind of outreach is there um, at the federal level for these folks um, and um, I would just like to add a little bit there and, and just to say at the southeast climate adaptation science center we want to really grow the circle of partnerships um, so the more that we connect with all communities, um, the better. And so there's many opportunities, I think, um, trainings or webinars or resources that might be helpful to begin your own community resiliency program. If we can assist in that way, we, we would very much welcome that. Um, so I'm glad that that hopefully you found out about this webinar if you're in the Southeast and don't have federal recognition, but we'd love to hear from you. Um, and connect you uh, with some of the resources that we have. Yeah, thanks, Rance. And I'll also mention this is Rachel. Um, so yeah, as from the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, legal responsibility, we we do focus on federally recognized tribes, but that is that is just legally um, what our domain is basically. Um, but that doesn't extend to other federal agencies. Um, so I think uh, BIA and IHS, I think we're the only agencies that, um, that have that, um, that legal focus um, that just by definition of, of our organization um, and where our federal funding comes from. But other, um, other, other federal agencies um, aren't bound uh, by that like we are at, at BIA. 
So, so there's a lot more flexibility when working with other agencies, um, whether it's um, USDA or the, the agencies within USDA or um, other departments or bureaus within Department of um, Interior as well. Um, so, yeah, so just, just know that we are um, under more restrictions, which is working with sort of recognized from BIA um, and IHS, but that doesn't, um, that same focus doesn't extend to um, or restrict other federal agencies. So if other federal agencies can, can work more closely with state recognized tribes, and, and, um, and I know they, they do. So I uh, just wanted to clarify that um, it's not federal wide, um, there's other um, opportunities through other agencies. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I'd just like to comment that Dara Marks noted that in our study guide, we did mention the decolonizing conservation reading list. Um, so that's one of the resources that we have in the study guide that you might be interested in. Um, and then Matthew Bethel asks about how the CASCs work together across regions. And absolutely, we work with um, the South Central very much so. We coordinated with them when we held our science symposium in New Orleans. Um, in November. And so we were able to connect with uh, state recognized tribes and other native communities in that area that attended the symposium. Um, and then we co-fund some projects together um, around that, that area of coastal Louisiana. Um, so very much so, Matthew. But if you have some other specific questions, please follow up with me and I'd love to hear more. Um, I know we're a little bit past the hour, but I just wanted to show real quick um, um, just a couple of items here before we close. And just to say again, thank you so, so much for all of the authors um, that were part of chapter 15. And then also I'd like to really acknowledge um, with respect to contributions to the Southeast chapter, Julie Maldonado, April Taylor, Alessandra Geraldman, Chantel Camardell, and Michael Bolt, who also informed um, the Southeast chapter specifically with those tribal case studies that we had. So again, thank you so much to them. Um, again, the URL for the, Nash, the fourth National Climate Assessment is right here, um, nca2018.globalchange.gov. And um, very easy to find the report chapters and lots of the graphics that Casey talked about and Rachel talked about are downloadable. Um, you'll see that downloads link on the right hand side. And then two of the key products um, that I just wanted to point out is the what we call the CCSR, the Climate Science Special Report, and then the actual volume two, which is the actual report um, that we've been delving into. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to tell, uh, just inform everyone that we are having a summer science web series that's starting April 16th. Um, and there is the URL, it's a go link there if you want to find out more information and register for those summer series. I think uh, because of the uncertainty of how the COVID-19 will evolve, we want to make sure that cr we create community virtually and to continue to give um, citizens, communities, partners access to information while we shelter in place. Um, so again, thank you so much, everyone. We had a terrific turnout today. Uh, we apologize for some of the technical glitches, but we did record um, this presentation and we will be sending information shortly, um, a link to the recording um, to all of you. So again, thank you so much, Casey and Rachel, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you everybody. Stay well, stay safe.